Welcome, everyone. I'm Artie Rye from Duke Law School and the new Duke Law Center for Innovation Policy. We're really delighted to have you here and to be sponsoring this conference together with One Mind for Research and the Kauffman Foundation. I think we have an exciting day ahead of us, and I want to uh, alert you to perhaps the obvious that there are a lot of contentious issues surrounding questions of approaches and incentives in drug development. We have deliberately uh, chosen panelists who have divergent views on these questions, and we want these folks, um, our speakers, to, to be candid and to uh, assert their views uh, forcefully. The specific focus is on small molecules, um, but I th and I think we can all agree that there is improvement to be made in this area, that uh, the rate of innovation in the area of small molecules in general, and perhaps particularly with respect to molecules in the neuroscience area, is less than optimal. So that much we can agree on. Um, as I've indicated, the speakers will probably disagree on a fair amount after that, which is good. That's exactly what we want. But we're hoping that we can move beyond the sort of point-counterpoint approach these issues sometimes take on, um, the, or the debate over these issues sometimes takes on, to uh, a more data-driven, ideally, um, uh, an approach that, that where we can find some areas of overlap. So with that, I'm going to turn the panel over to the moderator for the first session, which will focus on FTC versus activists, Stuart Benjamin. So, uh, I'll make this uh, short and sweet. You all have the various uh, bios for the, uh, the panelists today, so I will not, I will not go over them. Um, and each panelist will talk for about um, 15 minutes. I will have note cards, which I will be ruthless in using and throwing at them as, as, uh, as is needed. Um, the, the, we're getting this started because there's this big case, FT, FTC versus activists, and it's useful in setting the table to talk about both the case and the larger issues that it raises and what we can, and what we can learn from them. So without any further ado, um, we'll start with Michael, and then we will, uh, we will move down. Well, thank you, Stuart, and thank you to Artie and Stuart for putting together such an important conference. Pharmaceutical innovation is an absolutely crucial issue, and I think Actavis is a great place to begin because the intersection of patent law, antitrust law, the pharmaceutical industry, the Hatch-Waxman Act is a complicated area, but the Supreme Court has shed a lot of light on the issue. Not all the light in the world, but a lot of light. And so what I'd like to do is to first talk about the Hatch-Waxman Act, which is the relevant regulatory regime. Second, I'll talk about the world before the Actavis decision. Third, I'll discuss the Actavis decision itself. And fourth, I'll make some comments on how this affects innovation. So first, in terms of the Hatch-Waxman Act, 1984, Congress looks out at the state of the pharmaceutical industry and says that something needs to be done. The effective life of patents had fallen from 17 years to seven years, so brand firms needed to have extra incentives. Generic competition was non-existent. There were 150 drugs that had gone off patent term and still did not have any generics on the market. There was a gap of several years. And so Congress enacted this complex regulatory regime that was designed to solve several of these problems. First, it created several provisions designed to help the brand company. The first of those was patent term extension. For half the time that a drug is in clinical trials, plus all of the time after clinical trials awaiting FDA review, you are entitled to get a patent extension. The extension can last up to five years, leading to, more, to no more than 14 years remaining in the patent term. And so the first thing that Congress did was it allowed for patent term extension. The second thing that it did was it created periods of non-patent market exclusivity. Usually when we think of exclusivity, we think of patents, but there is a whole array of non-patent market exclusivity that's built into the Hatch-Waxman Act itself. 
And so the first is known as NCE exclusivity, new chemical entity exclusivity. And that is a five-year period for a drug that treats the active ingredient, the chemical compound in the body. Then you get five years of filing exclusivity, which means that no generic can file with the FDA for a five-year period. The FDA can't even receive it. And so that five-year period is pretty strong, four years in certain cases, as we might discuss later. But that is a very strong period of exclusivity when we're talking about the active ingredient on the drug. There's also what's known as clinical exclusivity. When you have a three-year term, this deals with approval. The FDA cannot approve a drug for which there are new clinical trials, uh, new dosage forms, new indications. And so that is a second form of exclusivity that's in the Hatch-Waxman Act. So between the NCE exclusivity and the clinical exclusivity, we have non-patent exclusivity that's part of the Hatch-Waxman Act designed to help brand for I'll take a quick detour and talk about a couple of other types of exclusivity, not in Hatch-Waxman, but nonetheless helpful to what we're talking about today. So one involves pediatric exclusivity, which gives you six months at the end of a patent term or FDA exclusivity designed to encourage experiments and clinical trials involving children. Otherwise, the concern is that that won't take place. Another type of exclusivity is known as orphan drug exclusivity that gives you seven years of protection where there are fewer than 200,000 people that would be treated by it or there is a concern that sales will not cover costs. This is another type of exclusivity. And the final one is not in the small molecule setting but with the biologics where we have large molecules from living organisms, there is a period of four and 12 year exclusivity. Four year filing exclu exclusivity in which an application cannot be accepted and 12 years in which it cannot be approved. And so in short, there are a lot of incentives for brand firms to come to the market that are based not just on the patent system, but on these periods of data exclusivity as <laughs> well. And so all of that deals with the non-patent market exclusivity. Again, an incentive under Hatch-Waxman that was given to brand firms. And then there is a third incentive as well, which is a 30-month stay. And so basically what happens here is that the brand files a new drug application. It lists the patent and the drug in the orange book. And then the generic files a certification without getting into too much detail, what's known as a paragraph four certification, means that the generic Eric thinks that the brand is invalid or not infringed, and so as a result, the so as a result, the uh, there is not a, there there's an attempt to enter before the end of the patent term, and so it is the paragraph four certification in which there's an attempt for early entry. And that is the best for competition and the area that has been most ripe for antitrust concern. Again, all of that is helping the brand firm. And then the question is, well, what's there for the generic firm? There were three provisions as well. And so one involves the ANDA process, the abbreviated new drug application process. It says that the generic does not need to replicate the full set of clinical trials that the brand conducts. Rather, it can piggyback on a lot of the work that the brand does. Second is an experimental use defense that says that the generic is able to experiment during the term of the patent. And then finally, we have a 180-day period of marketing exclusivity. If you are the first to file one of these paragraph four certifications, saying that the patent is invalid or not infringed, then you get 180 days to yourself on the market. That is very valuable, and that has led to a lot of the antitrust concern. And so in five minutes or less, that is the regulatory regime that we are confronting. It is a complex regime, and it has led to all sorts of problems. And certainly, it's beneficial in terms of increased generic competition, but also there are 
problems, in particular antitrust problems that have arisen. When you consider that the first paragraph for a filer gets 180 days of marketing exclusivity, that is a practical matter. No other generics are going to enter before that period, and that period can be delayed years down the road, then you get antitrust concern. And so basically the state of the world before the Actavis decision was that these agreements by which brand name drug companies pay generics to stay off the market were basically automatically legal. The courts didn't say that, but they did say we'll look at the scope of the patent and we will assume that the patent is valid and infringed and because under the patent you have a right to exclude, then a payment is a lesser subset. You can exclude someone under the patent completely and so therefore you could pay them to exclude them almost completely or up until the patent term. And so you look at courts, in particular there are courts in the federal second and eleventh circuits that applied a bunch of tests to say that these agreements automatically were fine. They said that these agreements were within the scope of the patent. They said that these were settlements and settlements are a good thing. They said that we don't know if the patent is good or not, but we will presume that the patent is valid. There's a procedural presumption of validity in the Patent Act. And so therefore, chances are the patent is valid, and so we don't really have to worry about it anymore. And then finally, they said that this is natural. It happens all the time, so how could it be bad? And so I think that there are problems with each of these lines of analysis. I think the scope of the patent test assumes the issue in the case of whether or not the patent is valid and infringed. I think that the, the settlement argument misses out on the whole fact that there are a lot of other policies in addition to settlement. And in fact, the reason for Hatch-Waxman and generic competition was to encourage challenges to patents, not to have settlements that would get rid of these challenges to patents. The presumption of validity is just a procedural presumption. It should not decide the case. And then this notion that it is natural, again, doesn't tell us anything. Of course it's natural because it's in the brand and the generic firm's interest to settle these cases, both the brand firm and the generic do better in these cases. The brand gets to continue its monopoly, no one gets to challenge it, and the generic has the certainty of getting a pot of money without even entering the market. So of course it's in the interest of the brand and the generic firm. That doesn't mean that it is legal. So at the end of the day, I think that the court's analysis between 2005 and 2012 was not very persuasive, but nonetheless, the appellate courts in this country said that these agreements were almost automatically legal. And so then we get the Third Circuit decision in Pennsylvania that for the first time said that there is a problem here, that maybe these things are not okay, and that teed up the circuit split that led to the Actavis decision that was handed down a few months ago in June. So in Actavis, the Supreme Court made several path-breaking rulings that are absolutely crucial that this is not just about patent law, but antitrust has a role to play as well. It also said that there was a potential for genuine adverse effects on competition. When you get rid of the chance that your patent will be found to be invalid, this presents significant anti-competitive concern. The court also said we can assume market power. Why would there be a large payment from the brand to the generic if not for the fact that there's market power? And the court said that you do not need to litigate the validity of the patent. And so many times the settling parties will say, look, I have a strong patent, so therefore let's litigate it in court. And that shows that the payment is okay. The Supreme Court clearly said, no, you do not need to litigate, to litigate the validity of the patent. Rather, it is the payment that is the key. The payment from one company to another to delay entering the market is the key here. So what we learned from Actavis is that you don't have to look at the patent, but when, the, but when one company pays a second company not to enter the market, that presents significant anti-competitive concern. So finally, some thoughts on innovation. One is that when you look at the Hatch-Waxman Act, it's clear that innovation is only half of the equation. And so yes, innovation is important under Hatch-Waxman, but generic competition is extremely important as well. And the drafters of Hatch-Waxman said things like this will do more to contain the cost of elderly care than anything Congress has passed. And numerous other comments like that showing that cost is important here. You look outside 
Hyatt Hatch-Waxman at these drug product substitution laws, saying that in most cases, you go to the pharmacy, you give them a prescription, they can substitute a generic for the brand. Again, not completely encapsulated within innovation, but something that is crucial to competition in the pharmaceutical industry as well. Another point is that competition is good for innovation. If there is a sense in which the brand firm has to come up with a new revenue stream, then that could encourage innovation rather than relying on every last ounce of profits from every single day that the patent term can be pushed back with one of these settlement agreements. Another relevant point to innovation involves the patents at issue. So I don't want to steal the thunder of Bobbin, who's written a lot about this, and so I won't give you exact figures, but I will say that most of the patents at issue here in these settlements are not on the active ingredient of the drug. They're on the formulation, the particle size, something that is not as crucial for innovation. And so we need to think about that when we think about the effects on innovation. A fourth point is that there are multiple patents that are involved. Again, we're not talking about the active ingredient in most of these patents. We're talking about successive patents going down the road. And so entry takes place long after the active ingredients patent has expired. And you say, oh, it's before the end of patent number eight. But we're just getting those on more and more trivial patents. And the final point is that the argument that we often hear from a lot of the settling parties is that settlement would not be possible absent these payments. A brand has to pay the generic, otherwise we're not going to get settlement. I don't think that is correct. We have natural experiments in which, for example, from 2000 to 2004, the FTC was looking at these agreements. Courts had not yet, had not yet signed off on them. And we saw that parties were still able to settle their cases. They just did it in ways that were better for competition. In other words, the brand not paying the generic to delay entering the market. So at the end of the day, I think the issue of pharmaceutical innovation is a crucial issue, but I don't think that brands need to pay generics to stay off the market in order to get that innovation. I think the Supreme Court, with five justices and Justice Breyer writing for the majority, said clearly that these agreements can present anti-competitive concern, that there's a real concern when you get rid of the risk of competition. There's a challenge to invalid patents. That's a crucial element of the process. And so while we'll be talking about pharmaceutical innovation a lot today, I don't think that reverse payment agreements by which brands pay generics to go away are a central part of innovation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, RT and Stuart, uh, and to the uh, uh, organizers and, and funders for putting on this important and timely event. Um, actually, uh, this doesn't have to be up here yet, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> I come from the perspective, I come to these issues from the perspective of a, of a health and innovation economist, um, and actually don't know all that much about antitrust, so I'll leave that to the, to the others here. Um, I think about generic patent challenges and by extension uh, about about settlements and pay for delay settlements from the perspective of patent quality. So it's well known, um, indeed I used to put up slides on this, but it's so well known that I don't anymore, that the Patent Office occasionally issues patents um, uh, that probably don't meet standards of novelty and non-obviousness. Uh, um, so there's funny examples like the crustless peanut butter and jelly sandwich that used to get a laugh uh, you know, 10 years ago, but I think now everyone's seen that slide, so I don't put it up anymore. Uh, method for exercising a cat with a laser pointer and, and others. Um, even more importantly, the Patent Office occasionally uh, issues patents that overreach as blatantly uh, in fields that are important, like pharmaceuticals, that it, uh, that as, as the uh, uh, humorous examples I just mentioned uh, may seem to overreach um, to a, a lay audience. Um, and in drugs, these are actually important because they can delay uh, generic competition, um, and they may also shape uh, the rate and direction of innovation, as I'll talk about in, in more detail later on. So one source of the, uh, oh, are you doing that? Okay. <laughs> uh, one source of the patent quality problem at the U.S. At, uh, patent office is that uh, the patent office lacks uh, the resources um, 
examiners may lack incentives, uh, and it may not even make sense to provide uh, a very rigorous, rigorous scrutiny to the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patent applications it receives each year. Um, so instead, in the U.S., we rely on litigation to scrutinize patents ex post, uh, recognizing that this litigation is costly and subject to a range of collective action problems. Hatch-Waxman sets up these bounties uh, the, in the form of the 180-day exclusivity that Michael talked about in order to incentivize uh, generic firms to, to, challenge, to challenge patents. Uh, since Hatch-Waxman, uh, in, in essentially the three decades since, uh, there has been a, a sharp growth in these paragraph four patent challenges. Um, and around the same time, there's also been uh, a, a sharp gro growth in so-called secondary patenting. So here's where uh, the slide, uh, the fr I'll show you the first slide. Um, the first slide shows uh, the, on the left panel the share of drugs with non-active ingredient patents by approval cohort. I mean, you'll just see that there's kind of a hockey stick shape, but generally it's going, it's going up over time. So the way we figure this out is we worked with a former patent examiner uh, at the, uh, from, from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, uh, and this is myself and uh, uh, a colleague at Columbia Law School, Scott Hempel, and we read every patent on the, um, on the FDA's Orange Book since the beginning of time, and we looked at the claims and we, um, we coded the claims very carefully. What I'm going to show you now is just a dichotomous cut, whether, they cover the active, whether the patent has a claim that covers the active ingredient or, or not. And you'll see that these non-active ingredient patents, which are often thought to be lower quality patents in the sense of being less likely to be valid or infringed, that they're rising, uh, uh, they're rising over, over time. Now, you don't have to take my word for it that these are lower quality patents, um, or at least you have to take my word for it based on data. I'm going to show you some information on that uh, a little bit later on. But for now, they're going up. Um, these also tend to be filed later, late in the life of a drug, uh, and, uh, and thus delay the final expiration date. So. Uh, as a result, nominal patent life, the time from when a drug hits the market to when the last Orange Book listed patent on a drug expires, has also been increasing, um, has also been increasing over time. Um, so have patent challenges. Um, so um, we argue in a series of papers, uh, a first in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies, a sec second in the Journal of Health Economics, that these trends are related. Essentially, what aggressive uh, secondary patenting or evergreen and giveth, these patent challenges taketh. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of the results, the, uh, the first panel of this chart uh, shows at the drug level, so for a range of drugs approved between 1990 and 2006 or something like that, uh, the share of drugs uh, that are receiving challenges by characteristics of their patent portfolio, what you'll see there is that drugs that have non-active ingredient patents only or non-active ingredient patents and an active ingredient patent are much more likely to draw challenges than drugs with only active ingredient patents. There's a range of issues with that that people brought to our attention. So instead, we moved to the patent level in another paper that uh, uh, was published in the Journal of Health Economics. And there we find that within drugs, it's the non-active ingredient patents that are getting challenged. So 75% of non-active ingredient patents uh, in, in this particular sample of drugs draw challenges, uh, uh, but only about 30, 29% of active ingredient patents. Overall, 85% uh, of paragraph four patent challenges are on non-active ingredient patents. Um, so, uh, so that's that. Um, so earlier I suggested that these non-active ingredient or secondary patents are weaker. Um, we can also uh, We can also look at some data on that. So this is a third paper that came out in science recently. Um, where we look at what happens to challenges to different types of patents when they are, when they are litigated. Um, there, what we find is that for patents litigated to completion, the brand almost always wins on the active ingredient patent, and the generic almost always wins on the non-active ingredient patent. So the top panel shows all litigation um, uh, over, over time. Uh, and if you, uh, you'll see there that uh, something like so it's hard to interpret litigation statistics when there's a settlement option, which is partly why we do the, the bottom panel. But um, what, the top panel, what the top panel is, uh, is showing you that when active ingredient patents are litigated to completion, so if you take out the settlements, then 62 out of 67 of those cases, the brand wins those. So that's about 93% of, of the time. Um, when non-active ingredient patents are lit, or secondary patents, uh, as they're called in this chart, are litigated to completion, the generic is winning two-thirds of the time. Now, this is hard. 
Uh, it's hard to kind of interpret these things because there's a settlement option, there's a big literature on this. Uh, so instead, we can look at earlier litigation as well, pre-2006, um, um, when settlements for various reasons uh, were, were more difficult to receive more scrutiny, so there was fewer settle there's fewer settlements in the data. The sample size is smaller here, but the story is, is even more stark. There, for active ingredient patents, uh, brands went 100% of the time, and for non-active ingredient patents, uh, it's, it's usually the, the generics that are, that are winning. So uh, I suggested earlier that legal scholars and people in the industry believe that non-active ingredient patents are, in fact, weaker. These, these data provide um, some, some evidence of that. Okay, so what does all this have to do with, with FTC versus activists? Um, in the science paper and in related analyses, we also, sh also show that 89% uh, of pay-for-delay settlements are on non-active ingredient patents. So pulling this all together, um, we start from the perspective that litigation from patent challenges provides uh, a strong second look to weak patents, a second look that's particularly important given that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office cannot or maybe even should not provide intensive scrutiny to uh, uh, the hundreds, and th hundreds of thousands of applications it receives annually ex ante. Instead, um, what Hatch-Waxman does is create a system where uh, the secondary patents in particular are getting a strong second look ex post after they've been revealed to be important, right? Uh, after, they're, uh, uh, after, after they're being listed on the orange book as associated with the drug on the market. Um, when they get the second look, generally generics prevail. And the implications for activists is by not allowing this process to play out, pay for delay settlements, which are disproportionately about non-active ingredient patents, uh, sort of interfere with this hatch wax from the machinery, uh, thereby strengthening weak patents. So finally, let me talk about, uh, let me talk about innovation, um, which is what the organizers asked me to do. Uh, and I confess that it's hard. Um, thinking about the effects of this on innovation is, is quite hard. Uh, one argument from settlement defenders, and this was in, in, in a number of the uh, uh, briefs associated with the case, <coughs> is that settlements reduce brand profits and therefore harm innovation. Um, so I confess I find this a, an odd argument um, because it almost proves too much. Um, you could use that argument to justify just about anything that increased brand profits, including price fixing or highway robbery or whatever. Um, moreover, the uh, the literature on, on, on contemporaneous profits and rates, uh, and, and, and rates of innovation is, uh, is more mixed than I think it's been characterized as being in, uh, in, in, in at least the briefs. Um, but let's put that aside. Even if we accept that more profits mean more brand innovation, we have to recognize that uh, patents on a specific subset of things are going to affect not only the rate but also the direction of innovation. So um, the idea that we advanced in the science paper is that uh, if settlements are disproportionately making secondary patents stronger, and these are disproportionately on incremental innovation, then they're going to disproportionately second, uh, uh, subsidize or incentivize incremental innovation. So that's, that's the basic argument. Now, this is not to say that incremental, inter, incremental innovation is not important uh, or valuable. Sometimes it is, but I think everyone would agree that in general, it's not as, as uh, valuable clinically, economically, or socially as new chemical entity in, uh, innovation. So that's the basic argument. Um, but I said it's hard. Uh, so let me, let me conclude by emphasizing some of the sources of uncertainty in this, in this argument. Um, first, the net effect of secondary patenting um, and by extension, settlements that boast their secondary patents on new chemical entity innovation is ambiguous. To kind of, to kind of abuse some language from um, first year microeconomics, it depends on whether the income effect, the notion that more profits from anything lead to more innovation, uh, or the substitution effect that more profits from certain type, from secondary innovations will incentivize secondary innovations over new chemical entities. It depends which of those two effects dominates, right? So there's an effect on the rate of innovation, an effect on the direction of innovation, and uh, at least as far as I think about it, like it's theoretically ambiguous which of those is, is, gonna, is going to dominate in, in these contexts. A second related uncertainty is that even new chemical entities uh, may rely on secondary patents to tack on additional years of, of, of uh, exclusivity onto the end of their term, uh, and that may get us closer to the uh, optimal <laughs> patent term, whatever that magic number, whatever that magic number is. 
Um, currently, active ingredient patents for new chemical entities sustain 10 to 12 years of market exclusivity. And so the idea is that, uh, you know, perhaps we need secondary patents to provide an additional boost to get them up to whatever the right number is. I'm sort of skeptical that that's a good solution since they provide even more of a boost to non-new chemical entity innovation. Uh, but but I'm, open, I'm open to that. Um, just on that, on that last point, uh, uh, I did some calculations on the incremental patent uh, or exclusivity that secondary patents give to new chemical entities or versus non-new chemical entities. So you look at the last expiring uh, secondary patent versus the last expiring active ingredient patent, and you look at, uh, you basically take averages over, over all the drugs ever approved. And, uh, you know, if we just, the top bar is the mean, the second bar is the, is the median, uh, the median boost to exclusivity that secondary patents give to new chemical entities is about 2.9 2 or 3 years. Um, it's 11 or 12 years for, for non-new chemical entities. Um, so then I'm running out of time. A third uncertainty is whether challenges would take place in the first place without the prospect of settlement. Um, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's an important issue. My instinct is not going to be an issue for medium to high sales drugs, but uh, perhaps Brett will talk about that uh, a little bit more. But I think that's an important, uh, an important thing to think about as well. And finally, um, I've kind of provided some uh, what, what I think the direction of the effect uh, would be, but the magnitudes would depend ex on exactly how much uh, settlements are delaying entry uh, relative to the fully litigated outcome, which um, we don't really know about uh, yet. So thanks for the opportunity to share these ideas, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, so I want to uh, supplement with what the previous panelists have talked about uh, by talking about a couple things. Um, first is just what is the effect of the Actavis decision going to be on reverse payment settlements? And I think it's in some ways still too early to determine exactly how big the effect is going to be. Uh, it's important to note that you know, even before Actavis that reverse payment settlements were being frequently and vigorously challenged. Um, both by the FTC and by private plaintiffs. Um, there were circuit court decisions in some circuits that determined that, or that were uh, relying on the scope of the patent test and were essentially allowing most of these settlements to go through, but there were other courts that were relying more on the rule of reason approach that uh, Actavis endorsed. And so there was still uh, frequent challenges. Um, since, since 2005, under the Medicare Modernization Act, the FTC, uh, the parties that settle have been required to give uh, notice of the settlements to the FTC. The FTC has been challenging them. Uh, so there has been uh, enforcement before Actavis. I also think there's going to be considerable, there's still considerable uncertainty as to how the courts are going to implement what is, you know, can be a fairly complicated rule of reason analysis uh, that Actavis lays out. Um, to be sure that the impact of Actavis relative to some of the other standards that were under consideration uh, is substantial. The difference uh, in how reverse payment settlements are treated under uh, the rule of reason approach versus the scope of the patent approach, which is what Actavis was endorsing, uh, and versus the approach that some had advocated that these settlements should be per se illegal uh, is, quite, is quite different. Um, second, uh, it's important to, I think, keep in mind two concepts of, of competition. Um, there's, a, there's tension in you know, all high technology industries between the benefits of providing static or short-term competition, like price competition, and the benefits of dynamic and, and long-term competition, like innovation. Uh, this is certainly true in pharmaceuticals, where uh, patents play an important role role in determining incentives to innovate, and patent challenges by the generics play an important role in determining the patent term. Um, and the primary focus of the Actavis decision and the FTC in its, in its enforcement activities has really been short-term competition. Do, you know, do, do these settlements 
uh, do reverse payment settlements delay uh, entry by lower price generics? So, and, and so I think the harder question is not, you know, whether the Octavius decision the, will decrease the effective patent term and the incentives to innovate. I think it will to some extent. I think the, the, the harder questions are how large is this effect going to be and importantly, how does it balance with the, uh, with the effects of, of short-term competition? So there will, under Octavius, there will be increased generic entry to the extent that these reverse payment settlements were delaying it, uh, and that comes potentially at the expense of some reduction in innovation incentives, and you know, what's the right balance between the two? So, you know, as, as others have said, it's, it's difficult to really evaluate what the bottom line uh, effects of Actavis are going to be on innovation, innovation incentives. And so I think you know, one way that can be helpful to understand these effects is to look more closely at a couple different types of, of reverse payment settlements and what would happen in a world where those settlements are, are not allowed. Uh, so I'm going to go through two examples. Uh, and there, there's, there's sort of two views on this. I mean, one, which is the FTC's view, and I, I think it's a view that, that Michael alluded to earlier, is that these reverse payment settlements are universally delaying generic entry. And without these settlements, there's going to be some other settlement agreement that's possible between the parties. So, uh, so what these settlements do is they just delay the entry date, but they don't, uh, they don't uh, increase the uh, ability of parties to settle. Uh, the second view is that while that may be true for, for some cases, there are other cases where these reverse payment settlements, in fact, are necessary for settlement. And so without these reverse payment settlements, uh, there may not be uh, a settlement possible and the parties may need to, take the, as, to litigate the, the case to judgment. Um, and you know, when, you, when you build a, an economic model that's uh, that, a richer economic model that accounts for things like risk aversion, asymmetric information, asymmetric beliefs between the parties, different discounts rates, uh, real, world, uh, real world conditions that affect, uh, that affect uh, negotiations, um, you can find that in some cases these reverse payment uh, settlements are necessary. So just to sort of concretely walk through what these reverse payment settlements really are doing, uh, the, take the, a, a simple example. So this depicts a, a, a patent litigation between the brand and the generic. The, on, the, on the axis at the bottom, it's, the, it's time. Uh, so the parties are in litigation uh, in year one. The brand patent expires at the end of year 10. So uh, if the generic wins the litigation, they're able to enter immediately. If the brand wins, the generic uh, can't enter until the patent expires in year 10. Uh, and if you assume, just for for simplicity, that uh, there's a 50-50 chance that each party wins the litigation, then if the parties are just going to negotiate on entry date, if, they're, if there's not going to be any payment involved, uh, if they're just going to negotiate on entry date, then uh, a natural settlement of the litigation would be that the generic can enter uh, at, at the end of year five, split the difference. Um, now, if we compare that to uh, a settlement with uh, generic entry where reverse payment is allowed, and this again, this is sort of the, the, the simple economic model that, that the FTC has in mind. Um, you, know, you allow a payment from the brand to the generic, and what that does is that then in, provides the, in, the generic incentives to agree to settlements not only at, at, at the end of the year five, which they would have done without a payment, but it also opens up that, the settlements in the, in the red area, uh, which are all generic entry later than year five. Um, so under this view of the world, the, uh, the reverse payment settlements um, open up additional settlement opportunities, but all of them have settlement later than the, uh, the settlement without a, year pay without a reverse payment. And you know, therefore, they delay the, the point at which the generic uh, enters. And so in this case, if we think about well, what are the effects on uh, the effective patent term and incentives to innovate, clearly, uh, a reverse payment settlement is going to lead to later generic entry and increased effective patent term uh, and subsequently decreased incentives to innovate. Now, that's not the only issue. The, there, there's a balance between the effects on competition as well, but the innovation effect is pretty clear. And so if we move from that's, that simple model to a model which 
adds in some additional uh, uh, factors. This one, let's, let's think about a generic that is cash strapped and has a strong preference to receive uh, profits sooner rather than later. So in this case, they, uh, because they, they have a, a strong preference for, for profits soon, they're only going to settle if they can enter relatively shortly uh, after you know, the beginning of the period. So there's a pretty narrow window after the start of, of year one where the generic is willing to settle. Uh, the brand, in contrast, is not willing to settle uh, you know, much earlier than, than the end of year five. So here, without allowing a reverse payment, there is no acceptable settle settlement range between the brand and the generic, and the, the only option is to litigate the case to conclusion. But if we allow a reverse payment into the mix, what that, that allows the generic to consider settlement options that are, uh, that are later than uh, the short period of time they were willing to consider before. Uh, there are also settlements where uh, uh, the brand would prefer it as well. So that opens up a broad, a broad settlement range between the brand and the generic. Some of these uh, some portions of this range may lead to a delay in generic entry relative to the point, uh, say, the end of year five, where the, the expected value, the, the average uh, outcome of if they litigated the case to conclusion, but others, that sort of red crosshashed area, uh, are settlements that wouldn't have been possible if the reverse payment hadn't been allowed, uh, that get the, that, but that actually benefit consumers um, by getting the generic to market relatively early. So again, the, the key question is really what, how do you balance uh, the effects, the price effects of delaying generic entry with the innovation effects uh, of you know, increasing the effective patent term. Uh, but I think, you know, in both of these views, uh, in sort of the FTC's world where, you know, reverse payment settlements just trump uh, a settlement with an early entry date, there the, uh, without the reverse payment, the uh, effective patent life is shorter and uh, incentives to innovate are reduced. In the case where a settlement might not be possible with a reverse payment, and what the reverse payment is really doing is, is increasing the uh, ability of the parties to settle, and, and, and some of those settlements can benefit consumers. Uh, what banning or reverse payments would, does is it, uh, you know, it, it forces the parties to litigate the, uh, to conclusion. And so you know, that increases the cost and the risk of litigation, and it reduces the incentives both of the brand firm uh, to innovate uh, especially, you know, if you think about small manufacturers that are heavily reliant on, you know, a single product. Um, and it also reduces the incentives for generic, t generic uh, firms to challenge patents because that challenge is now uh, riskier and more costly. And, you know, it may be the case for blockbuster drugs that these incentives are still strong, but uh, for smaller and, uh, you know, medium-sized drugs, these uh, effects can be important. All right, finally, Artie, you can come on up. So I'm not actually going to say very much for very long because I want to move to questions as soon as possible, but I want to give a somewhat different perspective on all of this that takes off a little bit from some of what Bhavan was talking about regarding the PTO granting patents that are of dubious validity. Um, I was at the PTO for a while, so I take that, that criticism and concern very seriously, and I think that's absolutely right. And one of the concerns that I have about the way that the system has been set up to deal with patents of either dubious validity or patents where one doesn't know whether the generic is actually infringing or not. Because note that in the context of, of Hatch-Waxman, there are two routes to market. Either you can say that the patent is invalid 
or you can say as a generic that you're not infringing, that you, you're bioequivalent but you're not infringing. And either of those can be a valid route to market. So in some of these cases, we not only have the question of validity, and actually in many of these cases, we not only have the question of validity but the question of infringement. So how to deal with that without getting that necessarily thrown into the lit litigation realm, which is necessarily uncertain and expensive, and uncertainty and expensive or bad, uh, expense are bad for everyone, is a puzzle that I've been thinking a lot about from my perspective as an administrative law scholar. I think in a first best world, we wouldn't have this uncertainty as to validity at all. In other words, we'd have, at least with respect to these important orange book patents, a very clear determination of validity from the outset. Now, Bobbin has actually talked about this along with Mark Lemley in some work he's done, and I've as well talked about it, the idea of a gold-plated patent, a patent where the validity is clear from the outset. Um, the entity that wants the patent gets a really rigorous examination at the patent office. That, unfortunately, was not something that I was able to achieve when I was at the PTO in the context of the American Invents Act, so that's off the table for the moment, but I think that would still be the first best solution, a clear determination of validity from the outset for these patents that are going to be on the Orange Book and therefore clearly important and not part of the hundreds of thousands of other patents the PTO puts out. That doesn't address the infringement issue, which is a separate issue. Even so, I think even with respect to infringement, there could be a more administrative approach to this that would reduce uncertainty and reduce expense, and that would be once a patent gets put on the orange book, the FDA and the PTO together make a determination as to whether a generic could come on the market with respect to that patent uh, without infringing. Uh, in other words, can you be bioequivalent without infringing? And that would just be a claim construction. It could be a claim construction that could be um, ultimately litigated as well, but at least we'd have some early certainty on that question as well. So obviously these are all approaches that could only be done through some sort of congressional enactment, and so I'm not necessarily holding my breath, but it seems to me that it really has to be the first best solution. It can't be that litigation is the way to go here. Thank you. Why don't you come on up? So um, why don't we first let the panelists respond to each other, and then we can take questions. We even have a mic for the webcast. For the panelists' benefit, because I didn't realize this, you actually have to push the button to talk to be recorded. So I don't know if, if we can just go down if you want to have quick responses to each other, and then we can uh, throw it open to questions with the mic back there. And just a quick note, um, this is all being webcast, so if you do have questions, please speak into the microphone if you're an audience member. So I just, to, to get things started, a, a couple responses to Brent. And one is this whole notion of static versus dynamic. We have static built into the Hatch-Waxman Act itself. It said that challenges to invalid patents are a crucial part of the system. That's a part of patent law. It's certainly a part of Hatch-Waxman. And here we also have Bobbin's helpful work on the type of patent it is, that's at issue. So if it's not the active ingredient patent, then perhaps we could worry a little less about innovation. In terms of the argument that, well, without a reverse payment, that these settlements would not take place. Uh, a couple thoughts. One, this is, take a step back, this is market division. When one company pays a second company not to enter the market, and we can come up with all sorts of complicated scenarios in which this would only happen in a certain way. But again, this is market division, and that's why the Supreme Court said in Actavis that you're preventing the risk of competition even on a valuable patent. It's not allowed. Of course the brand company is going to say, we're risk averse, this is our important patent you are stopping competition. It's also unclear why the settling parties would agree to a settlement that is just on the right side of the line. We are saying let's get rid of antitrust liability. There's nothing to worry about here because this is a settlement that would not take place absent a reverse payment. But if that's the case and the brand firm is making more money to delay entry until the end of the patent term and the generic is making more money to delay entry until the end of the patent term, why would they ever stop on just the right side of the line that happens to be good for generics when we've abandoned antitrust liability and 
and said, let's wait until the end of the patent term. And my final point is that you do not need to have reverse payments to have these settlements. We have natural experiments. Between 2000 and 2004, the FTC had challenged these agreements. The appellate courts had not said that these things are automatically fine. And as a result, we had 20 settlements. Zero of, the, zero of them involved reverse payments. Companies could still settle their cases, but on terms that were better for competition, in which there would be entry that would be earlier without a payment. And finally, you look at the European Commission, same thing. Between 2000 and 2008, there were a ton of settlements, 22 percent involved payments. All of a sudden, the European Commission shines some light on the issue. Settlements have increased since then, but payments have gone down, which shows that settlement is certainly possible, but you don't need to settle with these payments. Bob or Brett? Um, so a couple things. I mean, first uh, on, uh, I mean, the, so the Supreme Court in the Octavius decision, you know, determined that these should be uh, examined on a rule of reason basis. They didn't uh, endorse the argument that was favored by the FTC, which said these are presumptively illegal. They didn't <coughs> em endorse the argument that was uh, embraced by Octavius, which was, you know, that the, as long as it's within the scope of the patent, they should be allowed. They said, let's look at this on a rule of reason basis, that sure, these can, you know, there are incentives for the brand and the generic to uh, delay generic entry, but there are also circumstances under which these settlements may help consumers, and so we need to, to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, second, in terms of why would the firm stop, you know, just at the line, why wouldn't they push it out to the end? And that's, that's why we have this, this rule of reason antitrust enforcement. Uh, the settlements are going to get scru scru scrutinized, and if they, the settlements delay generic entry to, you know, uh, and don't benefit consumers, then uh, the, the courts have a chance to, to uh, look at that and, and undo the settlement. Um, and then finally, in terms of, of the natural experiment, it, yes, there, there were settlements before uh, these reverse payment settlements uh, kind of became much more common. I don't think anyone is, is arguing that without reverse payment settlements you wouldn't have any settlements. The, the argument is that there are some cases where you need these reverse payment settlements and settlements increase. And what you actually see in the data is after uh, the, the, the Cater decision and these reverse payment settlements uh, were treated a little bit more leniently, the number of settlements actually increased. So the data is consistent with the fact that these reverse payment settlements are, in fact, necessary in some cases for the parties to settle. Bob, or anything you want to add before we? Um, I, well, let's open it up to the audience. As, sure. As anybody has a question? You can just go to the mic right back there. And Bob, why don't you push your push to talk? So if, if you, if, yeah. You see, you see the little thing that says speak? Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is for Bob. Um, Could you did, identify? Yeah. Could you identify yourself? I'm Phil Johnson. Um, in doing your statistics, did you look into the percentage of the settlements that involved reverse payments, and do you have an estimate as to how many of those settlements were straight-up settlements, and or how many of those settlements actually were royalty-bearing licenses where the generic settled paying uh, royalty fees to the patent owner? That's the first part of my question. The next part of my question is, when you draw the conclusion that the so-called secondary patents are weak patents, but did you compare them statistically to the success rates of uh, patent assertions as a whole that tend to be under 40 percent success rates for all patent litigation? And thirdly, did you calculate in or did you take into account the, the idea that perhaps settlement or lack thereof, which is usually considered to be far more than half of all patent cases, may depend upon the, the downside consequences to each of the parties and the upside that may cause them not to want to settle as frequently and therefore go forward with cases that may be less certain and that to, re to account for the slightly but possibly not lower success rate <coughs> in those cases for, of secondary patents that are litigated to conclusion. Um, so that's a three-part question. I hope you remember all three parts. <laughs> Let me try. Um, so uh, the first one is easy. I haven't looked at that. Um, my co-author, Scott Hemphill, uh, has got a piece, I think, in Columbia Law Review uh, where, he, where he looks at some of these settlements and, and kind of and figures out the terms to the extent that he can. So um, 
I hope he's not watching on, is this on TV somewhere? Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. Um, so Scott, maybe you can email him. Uh, hi, Scott. Uh, um, um, so I haven't, but it's out there. Um, other people may know of, of more updated uh, uh, breakdowns than, than that. Uh, the second question, did we compare rates to uh, uh, litigation in general, which, right, so 40% or something like that is, is the number that people talk about uh, the, uh, in terms of patents that are invalid. Uh, no, we didn't explicitly, though. I mean, uh, I went through the numbers quite quickly, but note that, you know, we're talking about the success rate for brands on secondary patents uh, is something like 14% or something like that. So there's the... Uh, there's the comparison right there. So um, it's 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 much, it's much it's much lower. Um, and the third question in terms of oh, the Bobin, can I ask? Yeah. is that infringement as well as validity? No, that's that's anything. So yeah, we have yeah. we have not broken that, that so, down. Um, so that's one of the issues that I would enough. like to yeah. That's a, that, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. So that's that's important, I think. Yeah. Um, and the third question uh, in terms of reducing uh, costs and creating and, and uh, reducing uncertainty, I agree. I mean, I think the costs, like compared to the big set of numbers, like of a, what, what's at stake here, is, is sort of a rounding error. Um, um, so litigation is expensive, but relative to all the other stuff going on, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But um, but okay. Uh, um, on the uncertainty part, bless you. On the uncertainty part, uh, the costs are nothing to sneeze at. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, on the uncertainty part, I agree. I mean, I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty, which is why I like RT solution. I mean, I didn't want to come off as someone saying that this is a great system and it works very well. I actually think that, you know, the fact that patents are going up and challenges are going up, and at the end of the day, numbers I didn't show you, but effective market term has been basically stable for the last 30 years or so. Uh, it's this a very this a very costly way to get back to that equilibrium where it makes only lawyers rich. So I prefer uh, solutions like that that already advanced that would reduce uncertainty and costs. So. Ben is lined up now. So uh, I'm Ben Rowan. Uh, so I've got a, essentially one question, but it's got a few different parts to it. And, and the <laughs> reason why I got up was, was that last little bit you just said about, which was the, the market exclusivity period seems to have held steady despite all these changes. And that's sort of a weird thing that's true. So we're kind of, we're constantly focusing on all these shenanigans that are going on at the end of the patent term with the challenges between the generics and the pharmaceutical companies. And yet it just sort of looks like it's just preserving the sort of between 10 and 12 or 10 and 13 period of market exclusivity, which makes you wonder about uh, the implications of uh, uh, altering the dynamic, that maybe we are just sort of shortening the effect of patent life for these drugs as we go in, or maybe not, maybe something else will fix it. And the, the side point of this is, well, so all of this is based on this sort of assumption, pretty much explicitly, that if a patent is weak, then that means that uh, we actually don't want exclusivity there. So we're kind of using the patent rules, the patent laws, to decide what's the normative baseline for the optimum amount of protection. And that is that. And I have to admit, that seems to me like an aggressively bad assumption uh, based on the way in which we're deciding these cases, like what are the rules we're using to decide whether drugs should be patentable. And so stepping back, I think, well, uh, if we think that, and it seems to me, I mean, you've got this great data that shows this, that the drugs where you know, these patent challenges are more likely to be uh, occurring, and we're seeing these settlements in case we've got secondary patents, um, well, what does it mean that a company's relying on a secondary patent? So it seems like you've got uh, three different stories that are going on. So one of them is, is what I think the background assumption is here, and that's that a uh, company has had a patent protection on the active ingredient for a while, and it's now using a secondary patent to sort of lengthen its, its exclusivity period, and it's just using it as a form of shenanigans. Okay. The uh, two other ways in which that could be true. One is you could have a situation where this, the primary patent, so the uh, active ingredient, was unpatentable because it's just old. They couldn't get good strong, strong patent protection on it. It has nothing to do with the fact that they're lengthening their market life. They just didn't have good uh, patent protection over that in the first place. Um, and then the third is that maybe uh, it took a long time to develop that, uh, that initial drug, and so it actually took a long time for the uh, active ingredient to get on the market. And so they're relying on a secondary patent because you know, their primary patents on the active ingredient expired three, four years after they got on the market. The social welfare implications of settlements is going to uh, be very different under these three circumstances. So under the first one, you might say the shenanigans story this is potentially problematic. We're basically sort of giving extra life and we didn't mean to. Uh, the second story where you've just got an old drug that wasn't patentable, uh, but they were able to patent the formulation or get a patent on the use and never been using that, that actually suggests it's just sort of irrelevant. So that 
that secondary patent is totally fine. And then the third story actually suggests that, and these are, so if you've got a drug that took a long time to get to the market, those are probably the drugs that need the most protection. And so if, if the settlements are helping those drugs out, that actually might be exactly what we want to do. And so I'm just sort of wondering if we have a way of looking at not just the strength of the patent, but actually when we've got these settlements going on, what's the baseline period of exclusivity these drugs are ending up with? So are the settlements, are they extending patent life from 10 years to 13 years, from 13 to 15, from 7 to 10? <coughs> Uh, how is this playing it? Because that, it seems to me like if you actually want to evaluate the social welfare implications of this whole story, that's kind of the critical thing you'd want to look at. Mm -hmm. So for me, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, so um, that's, that's, very, that's very well put. Um, um, so I'm sympathetic to the notion, um, uh, I mean, I probably after reading your paper, that patent standards uh, uh, may not be well aligned with um, the social value of drugs and sort of trying to, you know, talking about weak, pat like weak patents can also often be associated with, uh, with good innovation uh, and there's certain types of things that could only rely on weak patents for various reasons because they're old or whatever. Um, so, um, uh, so that's just in general, I'm, I'm sympathetic to where you're, where you're coming from. Uh, in terms of the analysis you propose, I agree. I mean, I, th I think it's doable and so we should, we should just talk more about that. We haven't done that analysis yet. So I think that's absolutely right that you want to break it down. There is the third question though, uh, uh, which is just kind of a, an implementation question. I mean, even if settlements are getting you towards, you know, uh, let's, let's say that most of the settlements are strengthening weak patents on good drugs, there's still the question of whether that's the right way to do it or whether there's a better way to get, to get, get there. Uh, uh, it strikes me as kind of an odd way to get there, but I don't know. So I'm just going to follow up on that last point by saying part of the reason for this conference is precisely that, that obviously there, is a lot, there are a lot of ways that the patent system doesn't align well necessarily with what we want, which is good drugs that produce health improvement. And is, are there alternatives to the patent system that might be superior? Um, and in the context of this panel, is it the case that the current system is trying to get us there, but is obviously a very expensive, uncertain, and probably over-inclusive and under-inclusive way of getting us there? All right, and on, uh, I, Well, I'm, I, I'm, trying to run a, I'm trying to run a tight ship, and our next panel starts immediately. There's actually no break between this panel and, and, and the next one. So if we can thank this panel, the next panel, a set of panels can come on up. Thank you.